Okay. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Um, just a few words about um, um, to start. Um, please wear your mask, um, take distance, and keep care of each other. Um, so, welcome everybody to the start of the Society Politics Program 2022. And also welcome to everyone who joins us via the stream. Um, my name is Sarah Huber. Um, I'm the new curator of the Society Politics Program in Forum Stadtpark. And um, in case you um, haven't heard it, uh, haven't heard about it yet, um, this year Forum Stadtpark is the center for security. So in this year we discussed the term security or safety from different perspectives to figure out what makes us really safe. And one, one answer to that is feminism. And so of course, the focus of the society politics this year is feminism. And um, from that perspective, we will analyze the term um, security and talk about who is safe in the society and what do we need for a society in which everybody feels safe. So there will be a feminist conference um, and a series of lectures about infrastructure, uh, security and care. And also the debating society con will continue this year with Markus Gönitzer and Leo Kuberger. So please keep up to date with the program on Facebook, Instagram, or the Forum Stadtpark homepage, or with this beautiful folder, um, which um, 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 with the program of the year about um, the security topic. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome tonight my co-moderation Lane, and of course, Jules Joanne Deason um, with the book, Transgender Marxism. And I think in times of polarization within the feminist discourse and movements, it's really good to hear about this book, um, which collects different perspectives of the connection between trans 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 <laughs> transgender studies, sorry for that, and Marxism, Marxism which is pretty awesome. Um, also, it's an important topic if we talk about security or safety, that we also talk about the experiences of surviving as transgender under capitalism. So it's pretty um, cool to have you here tonight. And um, yeah, I think it's a perfect start for the program of the year. And now I give over to Lane and Jules. So hi, welcome all again from my side. Um, it's good to see you here, and thanks to the Kunstuniversität Graz for sponsoring this. And um, well, it's really nice to have you here, Jules, because um, it was just by chance that I've seen that you're living close by, so that we could invite you. And um, after I've read already a few texts of yours, which appeared in um, Commune Mac or um, the uh, blind field and um, also in the transgender studies. Um, then finally this book appeared and um, so several parts of what I was already reading um, came to some conclusion because finally there was this connection between transgender studies and Marxist theory, which was um, already by hand, but not um, combined um, so much into one um, comprehensive book. And um, I was uh, quite curious to find out that you're also a comedian, um, which I liked a lot. <laughs> And, um, well, I give the microphone to you and we'll have a short introduction at your book. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really pleased to be here in Graz. This is the first promotional event I've done in person, the first formal one, and it seems very appropriate to do it in Graz, which is keeping the flag red and the rents low, I know. So I'm um, really delighted to be here, and thanks to the Forum Stadtpark, and thanks also to Lane. So um, 
Lane invited me saying, uh, I was gonna, invited me to speak about the theme of noise. Um, uh, Cause yeah, it was her comment that there's kind of this noise coursing through the collection. So this is a presentation which is gonna be in two parts. And the first is called voices. And the second part is called sounds. <laughs> so the first bit, which is about voices is mostly gonna be about the content of the, of the book. And then the second half is gonna, I'm gonna play some loud music at you and see how you feel about it. But, <laughs> but there'll be a little Q and A between these two sections. So we can also have a conversation, why not? Um, yeah, so the first section is called Voices and it's about polyphony. And um, yeah, polyphony is kind of the uh, operating theme which Elle and I had as we were going through this collection, which as those of you who've read it, will know, um, has like quite a, quite a large number of contributors. It has 17 contributors in total. Um, it's got 14 essays, uh, our introduction, Al and my introduction, and then an afterword by Geordie Rosenberg. So um, that sounds like quite a lot of text and quite a lot of different viewpoints. Um, but the first thing I wanna say is that actually putting this collection together was sort of a matter of ease. Like it was quite, uh, <laughs> in a sense, once we began, the whole project was quite, was quite simple to get through. Um, and this is because we had this um, this basis, this kind of like uh, wellspring, if you will, of our collection was this rich and continual stream of analysis, which we were already reading and already participating in and, and already encountering, um, Alan, myself. Um, and this was mostly the kind of discourse, the kind of analysis, which was taking place in semi-private, like semi-private or kind of movement spaces um, and especially the places where those two things go together. Um, and uh, this is both what kind of enriched and livened this kind of discussion, but also what made it very fragile. So the example I often talk about is Instagram. I don't know how many of you here use Instagram. Anyone? Okay. <laughs> Finally, people are honest. Yeah, I think everyone, <laughs> everyone at least knows someone who uses it, right? So Instagram is the example I use because especially in 2020 in the, um, insurrections which were happening in the United States, everything seemed to kind of like shift even organizationally. I, I knew people who had never used that website before 2020. But the quality with Instagram is these stories which are used to promote kind of all sorts of events are designed to like disintegrate after a single day. Um, and uh, that's the first kind of fragility. So they kind of have a limited um, time span, but they also sort of have a limited reach because I've used this term like semi-private. So people are often kind of having dialogues and discussions with kind of like like-minded people. Um, I'm going to read out a passage of the book in a second, but um, I'll just make a few more comments on that. Okay, so our hope when we were putting together this collection was that we wanted to have a more sort of broadly accessible and also a more lasting form for all of these insights and all of this analysis, which we were already reading, which were already kind of taking place. And our hope was to put together something which was a bit more, <coughs> both something which was a bit more lasting, but also something which would kind of, um, like immediately be in use for like future waves of struggle um and then continuously like into into like um yeah future future conflicts and future movements which happen um in uh, the years to come so that was kind of the first aim to kind of producing more lasting but also to I hope was kind of allowing an opportunity for these 17 or so transgender marxists to kind of fully develop their insights and kind of flesh them out in a way which um say a social media post or a community meeting or a, a tense plenum for a left-wing organization inevitably doesn't really kind of allow space for. Um, and the reason we felt this was important was primarily because of what uh, the existing publishing, um, the existing way that transgender people get treated by publishing houses, which is very kind of heavily emphasizing confessional contents, like telling your life story. Um, and people are kind of under this imperative to um, confide and to confess kind of their whole um, life, often starting at their childhood or even their infancy, <laughs> and then kind of like giving an account for themselves. And, um, and this, is like, this is like a set of, um, this is like a set of imperatives, which I think is very interesting because um, even sort of like canonical mus movement texts, like for example, um, Giulio Serrano's Whipping Girl kind of has like heavy, um, heavy aspects of this. And then there are more kind of like stylized examples like Juliet Jacks, um, Jordi Rosenberg, most recently Grace Laveri, um, like her memoir sort of had this huge bidding war. So there's still uh, like several different publishing houses wanted to get hold of it. So even like um, the more kind of theoretical 
um, theoretically savvy, kind of like primarily intellectual writers are, are still kind of like in their own way dealing with this sort of requirement that they, uh, yeah, recount their entire life. So we wanted to do something kind of very different to that. And um, yeah, that's that's one of the things we're aiming to do. But the second thing, <laughs> I guess, this is the second thing in three parts, but bear with me. Uh, the second thing we wanted to do was um, move beyond um, move beyond the kind of existing state of left-wing analysis, such as it is, of transgender experiences and transgender struggles. And um, as far as we're concerned, like the issue, the issue with these stuff is there's sort of three different ways things can go. And one is like the kind of respectability move. So in this one, uh, trans aspects of lives have to kind of be hidden away. Um, and you don't really want to play into like the, <laughs> the enemy's hands, I guess. So this is the most sort of reactionary aspect of leftism. So this is like, well, you don't want to upset anyone or like um, discomfort people, uh, either discomfort people like who are voters or people you're organizing with, depending on the type of uh, leftism we're dealing with. So that's like the first issue is this kind of like respectability thing. The second one is kind of like um, framing identity against like systemic issues. And that's like, um, I guess in this kind of approach, it's like the idea is that identity, like um, identity positions and identity struggles are this kind of like secondary set of concerns or secondary uh, sets of issues, which are always kind of like counterposed to like the, the bigger picture and the bigger like um, the grander story. So you'll see this in a lot of Marxist thought for sure, like the worst of Marxist thought, but you also see this in kind of like uh, labor unionism and kind of stuff like that. So this is one which kind of like counterposes ethical processes. So it counterposes like um, life struggles with like the grander kind of mode of production or like um, bread and butter issues as they're called and so on. So that's like one of the kind of potential pitfalls. Um, but finally, and I think this is like the most insidious kind of thing, is there's often this, um, there's often this technique in left-wing spaces where sort of trans people are indeed queer people in general uh, or like LGBT, even women at some points, <laughs> kind of um, uh, people are kind of mobilized to provide critiques, so to provide sort of like like an existing system is that, and then um, trans people are then introduced to be like, oh, okay, well, this is the trans critique. And um, yeah, so the issue with this one is like, um, yeah, the issue with critiquing is that this always kind of seems to assume that like the analysis happens and then like the secondary thing is <laughs> it kind of gets picked apart, which like in my opinion is sort of like starting things rather too late, right? Okay. So that's sort of what we were trying to get away from. But um, yeah, but here's kind of a more hopeful passage, which I'm going to read out to you from the book. So um, this is from our introduction. So again and again, frameworks originating in the loose and meticulous tradition known as Marxism uh, were, to, were to be found by us uh, being brought to bear on questions around gender transition or how gender nonconformity can survive in a capitalist context more generally. But how did the analysis of economic modes and historical epochs come to be so intuitively directed towards gender transitions, the most immediate of ethical processes? Let's begin with our cultural denigration, by and large, which remains a pervasive feature of our life, the popularization of our experiences notwithstanding. Due to the stigma we encounter so routinely, trans theorization most often um, unfolds as a process of confiding and confessing. We speak about our own experiences more often than we attempt to speak comprehensively. We gather audiences that are as much our confidants as our comrades. This style of publication has the blessing of the concrete while also finding itself locked into inevitable repetition. Critical, critical vocabularies for grasping and one day defeating transphobia are invented and then reinvented anew. Commonalities between our epiphanies and attempts at repression result in extensive in-joking, moments of recognition that our most freakish features um, are also, from another view, quite predictable. Our struggles are at once life and death, and laughable, unique, or hackneyed. Slang comes into existence and becomes dated across seasons. Gender positions that previously went unnamed are barely christened before coming, before becoming uh, fuel for furtive in-joking. A resulting terminological churn threatens to become an end in itself, rather than emancipatory, rather than an emancipatory tool. This seems a revealing fate. Our genders exist at once in a normative, uh, in normative and, uh, sorry, exist at once in normative and in abstracted terms. For instance, women do this, men do that. 
and then intimately concrete ones. I've been on HRT for nine months now. Transgender experiences tra uh, straddle the conventional limits of political and private life, workplace and household. Transition is at once a procedure with far reaching social ramifications and also an intimately personal matter. But given this balance, why are so many transgender people apparently drawn to Marxism and to revolutionary theory more generally? As workforces have been driven apart into ever more splintered formations, reduced in many instances to the casualized gig, why has systemic thought blossomed rather than contracted over the first decade of the 21st century? Most obviously, the same stigma which causes us to confine our thinkings within private venues leads to our appearance in politics, proving so eruptive when it does happen. Transgender life is harsh enough that many are led easily to conclude that our conditions are beyond redemption, that no center-left party, third sector trend, or NGO can be relied upon to truly loosen the grip of our oppression. And so in recent years, for those introducing themselves to revolutionary circles, to hear trans and communist in the same breath has become quite routine. Again, we move between the freakish and outlandish to the predictable and the cliche. Through collecting these essays as a mass market book, we aim to capture the recent proliferation of gender deviant Marxist thought in a more lasting and accessible thought, uh, sorry, <laughs> more lasting and accessible form to move us beyond the limits of ornate in-joking and communal self-referentiality and towards social revolution, or at least to avoid unwitting repetition and hopeless clashes, as, <laughs> clashes of lingo and vocabulary as divergent scenes and traditions come to the same conclusions using different terms. Um, so, uh, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I'm going to just like um, talk a bit more about the polyphony <laughs> and more about the approaches taken. Um, so, so like the uh, <laughs> so I suppose the, the different chapters of this book, as I've kind of said, were mostly um, each of them is is kind of like intent. We intended to give the the person contributing it kind of like their own um, their own chance to kind of pursue the idea they wanted to do and kind of just let it play out in its own way. But I guess I would, <laughs> I would kind of like bracket um, the way people approach this in roughly like five kind of overlapping directions. There are some essays that look um, mostly at like the workforce side of things. So like Michelle O'Brien's um, essay on trans work uh, and K. Doral Greffis's Queer Workerism Against Work um, and also Nat Raha's um, contribution are all kind of looking at the different different ways that trans people like integrate or do not integrate with workforces. Um, we also have a few different um, perspectives that focus on particular locations, although these are pretty um, pretty varied. Like so for instance, Virginia um, Gitzel's contribution is looking at Brazil. Um, Nathaniel Dixon's essay is looking at um, Buffalo in the New York. And finally, um, Encounters in Lancaster is looking at or well, predictably <laughs> like Lancaster, which we'll talk about later in a bit as well. Um, there are also essays which look more at the processes in play. So my own essay, for instance, um, Noah Zazanis's, um Social Reproduction and Social Cognition, and finally Anya's essay uh, on proletarian trans women and science fiction, um, all kind of look at this, uh, yeah, look at transitions as they sort of unfold in more kind of like, um, yeah, in more responsive terms to what that actually looks like as a life change. We also have quite a lot of essays which are kind of trying to integrate Marxist perspectives with other schools of thought. So Zandra Metcalf's one is looking at psychoanalysis. We've got like a Deleuzian, um, uh, a dialogue on Deleuze in there. And um, uh, yeah, also phenomenology in, um, uh, yeah, in Zoe's essay. And then finally, there are, um, there are other there are other uh, essays in the book which do kind of look at primarily like um, personal life experiences and then try and draw like a wider conclusion out of that. So um, Farah Thompson's um, Farah Thompson's one again, Nathaniel Dixon, and then uh, Jane Hode's um, essay in Lancaster are clearly like part of those. So like so while there's a uh, range of styles and and different kind of perspectives. Um, which we include. The hope is like um, the hope is that at no point like the people writing essays don't really like, especially people aren't sort of obliged to engage in like apologetics or like respond to like imagined like phobic points of view. And this is kind of especially pressing as a concern in um, in Britain, where Ella's still based, um, <laughs> and where I was born, sadly, uh, <laughs> where. Um, responding to transphobia is such a pressing concern that kind of like true theorization is very rarely. 
um, possible. So, yeah, so what did we achieve with this? I guess I've got a few, <laughs> a few kind of provocative bullet points, which I guess we can discuss in whatever way you want. But um, yeah, I'm going to just kind of run through these and then uh, kind of bring this one to a close. So yeah, so I suppose like uh, this is kind of my own auto interpretation, I suppose, my own kind of self interpretation of what the collection looks like. So this is just my own personal perspective. <laughs> Feel free to disagree with me. Um, so, so the first thing which um, this collection kind of aims to do and I think manages to do is we're kind of trying to develop a counterweight to this sort of intuitive uh, contempt, this kind of intuitive disgust reaction, which a lot of the political right has really been capitalizing on, let's say, um, taking advantage of in recent years. So um, worldwide, the political right, the kind of global right wing has often used um, used like the breakthroughs of trans people, whether that's taken to be something, something that happens somewhere else and belongs to the West or something which is happening like within our own countries. Um, the political right wing has kind of developed this um, this aspect. So like it was important for us to try and develop a kind of reply to this conspiratorial aspect. <laughs> so something which is kind of at once um, nakedly pro-trans, if you will, uh, and also kind of resists this shifting into this framework of like the culture war, which is increasingly, actually this is especially in Britain, previously in the United States, but now, now especially in Britain, people talk about the culture war as like the key defining feature. So like within the culture war, if you're if you're pro-trans, you're on one side, <laughs> if you're anti-trans, anti -trans, you're another. So we're kind of like trying to preserve the, um, preserve the aspect of like class war as an aspect that like this kind of framing of things sort of um, risks us losing. In particular, um, this kind of culture war framework is always about particular flashpoints and particular horrible fantasies or like news stories or like uh, tabloid exposés. Um, <laughs> and we need to kind of like, get our focus like like on the actual relation, the actual um, uh, relations and the broader pictures which are going on. Um, and to do that, I would describe our approach as kind of like at once sort of setting out um, from a Marxist feminist framework, but also I think a lot of the time moving beyond the existing shape of Marxist feminism. And that's something I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A because I could say a lot of things about like social reproduction theory and especially my own contributions to this kind of topic are, are usually like characterized as social reproduction theory, but I feel like by the time we finished this collection, it was clear that this was saying would kind of moved um, both kind of through and also out of, like a lot of people participating clearly are not actually using that framework at all, although several are, especially like Nat Rohar and Noah Zazanis. Um, next point, um, I think what seemed very clear to me from the beginning and what's especially um, like obvious to me now is that unlike a lot of Marxist theorizing, this is not really an avenue of thought which belongs to any one um, sect, so any one <laughs> um, self-proclaimed revolutionary party, um, and also clearly not saying that belongs to any one faculty. So faculty as in like academic institutions using Marxism as their framework for uh, like the grist, the fuel for research production, um, which is how a lot of um, a lot of Marxist theory kind of that the form that it's been reduced to. Of late, so um, so yeah, kind of. I don't think like I don't think um, overall the essays in this book are reducible to any single like any single sect's perspective, but also any particular um, discipline. Let's say, um, yeah, and I think probably what these essays share is that um, I don't think any of them kind of like tries to efface or tries to remove um, experience, practical wisdom, and all of that, um, but also never really allows us to kind of like reduce it, uh, reduce our theorizing to to that. And I think that even goes for the, or especially goes for the kind of like more confessional life story cell pieces, which we have included. Next point. Um, I think like what we claim in the introduction, <laughs> maybe quite ambitiously, but um, what we claim in the introduction is that there's been this shift of trans culture out of a sort of subcultural form it used to take and into something that looks like a kind of beginning of a mass culture. And this is sort of what um, divides us perhaps in time as much as anything with earlier, uh, even the earlier theoretical work, which I see is very useful, like um, Talia May Betcher's um, philosophical um, treatments of like inclusion um, in, in that kind of conceptual sense. So um, so yeah, at this point, I feel like um, clearly the <laughs> clearly the thing we're responding to is sort of like, uh, yeah, kind of like a, a context shift out of that sort of previous, like more, like more identifiably subcultural aspect. Mm, okay, a few more points. Uh, so um, 
Right, so this is kind of like an approach to theorizing, which especially foregrounds the household, so private households, so families and um, the places where we grow up and integrating those into like broader, um, broader theorization. And again, this is something which um, I don't think it's really just uh, like left up to us to do. This is thing which already happens from political movements, which both we are part of and also the political movements we hopefully disagree with. So um, in our introduction, we talk about Angela Mitropoulos, who's um, one Marxist theorist who kind of like uh, has for several years now been kind of following the um, trajectories of the way that households and um, parental, patriarchal, whatever, um, household authority gets kind of like uh, appealed to and um, and kind of used used to stabilize movements from the like of Donald Trump and so on, and then more recent um, inheritors to his mantle. So yeah, so like we wanted to like foreground the household and the family without losing sight of the workplace. And um, I would say the workplace and also exclusion from it, which we're kind of dealing with um, during any kind of like gender nonconformity. So um, yeah, just a few more things to say. <laughs> Right. So, um, so yeah, I think everyone contributing to the collection is kind of, uh, kind of like savvy and familiar to the risk of, um, like the co-option or capture of um, LGBT movements or appeals or identities to like imperialist statecraft and also like institutional more kind of liberal forms. Um, but also, we don't really want to reduce developments uh, in yeah developments and breakthroughs and identification to this kind of like paranoid attribution of all social change to the scheming of states and corporations, or indeed George Soros. So yeah, so this is like, that kind of brings me to the end of <laughs> like what I think we've achieved. Um, but uh, in summary, like my hope is that like this collection is serving as a starting place for people who don't want to compromise either on these ethical processes of transition, so the um, immersive life changes that people go through um, with all the particularities um, and <laughs> particularities and peculiarities of that um, uh, of that moment, um, or the systemic view of like the social relations. So the social relations as in um, those things which we can only really define, <laughs> we have to define ourselves through, but also each participant is only defined through um, their relative position within. So in other words, uh, as Alan and I put it in the introduction, our aim is not to favor one side of the sensual or the super sensual, the, um, identity or the systemic, but instead to show how these two things can only um, ever be fully uh, realized together and how they're never really fully at odds, how what Marx calls sensuousness can be understood in detail and with more explanatory power um, than any amount of conspiratorial <laughs> or representational thinking from the left or the right could hope to offer us. So that's what we tried to do. The rest is up to you. Thanks. Thanks, Jules, for this very interesting input. Um, I think there are a lot of important um, and interesting arguments in it. So um, at this point, I have to say goodbye to the audience who watched this via stream. And we continue the discussion online. So bye. <laughs> <laughs>